Good afternoon to those I haven't seen yet. We are glad to see you here today. You can turn to a neighbor and tell them that you have to see them. Great. So, Norris is coming. And this year, if you have read news, we celebrate Norris for 10 days. Have you heard about it? And every day of Norris has its special name. I started reading an article about it, and it turned out that uh, the 17th of March, do you know that today is the 17th of March? And do you know what is the day of the name? The Shanrock Day! Yay! I was stunned when I read this. Now we, our church, have an official holiday, the 17th of the March. If you were attentive, you could see that on the slide it was written that no race would be on March 24, 2034. We are sure that in 10 years we will celebrate it too, of course, but this announcement was that we will also have a holiday this year. So, come. Well, let's think about this. Why have we come here today? Think about it. Just look into your heart. Think about it. Why? Why am I here? Why did I wake up and come to church? Why didn't I go to the movies or I didn't go to sledding or I didn't go to a book? What are the options? Timur, why did you come? For bread? Good reason. To listen to us? Okay. To glorify God? Okay. What else? For the sake of saving your soul? Mm, good. One more time. Uh-huh, to pray, to worship, okay, very good, more, louder, oh, do you need to wake up, good, nice reason, get the source, mm, great, okay, communication with God, good, what else did you say, to pray, to hear the word of God, do you understand that we all did not come here without any aim. Each of us has some kind of expectation inside. We don't want to waste time. When you go somewhere, there is always a goal. And we came to church today because we have a purpose. The goals may be different, but there is always a goal. Is there a serious crisis in your life right now? Are there people who have come with a crisis that Jesus needs to solve today. Are there any? Raise your hands. Here he is. Thank God. Are there people who would like your whole life to change and not just one crisis solved? Are there such people? Yeah. There are such people. Yeah. These are important questions we have to answer. Today we continue to read the Gospel of John chapter 4 from the verse 33 after the two days he departed for Galilee for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown so when he came to Galilee the Galileans welcomed him having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at first for they too had gone to the fest so he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And uh, at the Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for, his, for he was at the point of the death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see your signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will leave. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that 
was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was, this was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. So what's going on here? The first thing we see here is that Jesus can make miracles. Did you know about this? Yeah, Jesus can perform miracles. If we remember how it all started, in the first chapter Jesus calls his disciples, and in the second chapter he performs his first sign, he turns uh, water into wine, then he goes to Jerusalem where he performs merry miracles, cleanses the temple, then in the third chapter he meets Nicodemus and in the fourth chapter he meets a Samaritan woman and now we see how in the 43rd verse his disciples continue to go to Galilee. It is written that many people in Samaria believed in him but in verse 44 the author warns us that there will be no such result in Galilee. The prophet will not be accepted in his homeland and he is going to Galilee anyway. What for? This is a good question, which we will return at the end of the sermon. So Jesus goes to Galilee, and now we see that the Galileans have accepted Jesus. Why? It is written because they saw the miracles that he performed in Jerusalem. Moreover, they most likely still had the wine that he had made from water in such quantities that they probably had enough for a long time and we're thinking, when Jesus is coming back, we're running out of wine. And so, some of them were in Jerusalem for the feast, where, as it is written, he performed merry miracles. They came and said, he cannot only turn water into wine, he can also work miracles. They knew about miracles, and they liked it, and they accepted it. But look at the contrast. Samaritans believed in Jesus and the Galileans only accepted him. Their relationship to Jesus was similar to the attitude of Nicodemus when he came to Jesus at night in the third chapter and said, We know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Uh, that is, Nicodemus believed that Jesus could work miracles, he knew that Jesus could work miracles, but he did not know that um, the task of Jesus and the purpose of Jesus were not just making miracles, but the transformation of the person's life and his spiritual rebirth. The Galileans were in the same state. They liked his miracles, but they did not understand who he was. But this is a good first step, at least to know that Jesus can work miracles. Do you know about this? Yeah? Yeah, there are a lot of evidences for this. If you didn't know about it, you can read the four Gospels which describe the huge number of his miracles that Jesus performed. We read about in the book of Acts and in the Apostles. Moreover, there are people around us who have experienced the supernatural miracles manifestation of God's power through Jesus. If there has been a supernatural act of God in your life, please raise your hand. Who had this? Those who have never experienced anything like this, just turn your head around. Look at those hands. These people testify that there was a supernatural miracle in their lives. Of course, it doesn't happen every day because it's a miracle, but it is happening. Jesus can actually do such things. But Jesus cannot only work miracles in other lives of people. He can also work miracles in your personal life. He can miraculously solve any problem or crisis you are going through right now. Let's look at the example of such person. In verse 46, we see a man appear on the scene. What do you know about this man? Look, the first thing that is written is that he's from the city of Capernaum. It's about 45, 40 kilometers from Cairns. We have a map. Let's take a look at it. Jesus left Jerusalem 
Uh, this is the lower right dot. And went to Galilee, and he went through Samaria. The second red dot is Sikar, where they met uh, the woman at the well. Firstly, a woman went and preached to the residents of the city, and then Jesus and his disciples preached there for two days. And it is written that a large number of residents in Sikar turned to Jesus. But after two days, Jesus went to Cana, where people knew that he worked miracles. And the man who came to him was from Capernaum. There was a palace of Herod Antipas in Capernaum. And it is written that this man was an official or a courtier, who is the official, we would say, an employee of the president's office. What else do we know about him? Yeah, he had a son. This is a good news. The bad news is that the son was ill. How sick he was? Very ill. He was dying. And that's a bad news. So let's think about this situation a little bit. He was very rich. He had the means, the connections, the resources. He knew special people. Yeah, he had a son, and if he had a son, then that he probably had a wife. Let's imagine the situation. The son of an influential person got sick. What will he do? Do you think he came to Jesus right away? No. Most likely. What did he start doing? Yeah, he invited a doctor first. The best, most expensive palace doctor. Most likely it was his friend and he probably said, I don't know, the kid has been lying for two, three days. He is getting worse and worse. Come and help me. The doctor comes prescribes one medicine, another, nothing helps, the wife starts getting more and more worried, he connects his friends, doctors, prime ministers, he, he is looking for a solution, he is probably already talking to prime ministers in order to find something. He tries to use all his money, all his resources. Nothing helps. The boy is dying. He's fading away every day. Here is the situation. This man is in crisis right now. And he goes to Jesus. Do you think if the boy had not, hadn't been sick and dying, this man would have gone to Jesus? Such people don't need Jesus. In general, no one needs Jesus as long as we don't have problems. And it is written that he heard about Jesus. How did he hear that? He's at the palace. So there are news constantly coming to the palace like, here comes such a person, here is such news and such. And then there is a preacher who preaches incredible things he turned water into wine, performed many miracles during holidays in Jerusalem. And the official thinks, this is my chance. And he walks 35 kilometers to Jesus. That is, he heard, he came and asked Jesus for a miracle. This is a very important lesson for us about prayer for healing. And he did not say, by the blood of Jesus Christ, my son has already been healed. No. Absolutely no. He did not engage in any order suggestions. He did not manipulate him. He did not say, Jesus, I thank you that my son is already healed. He didn't say that. He asks. He, he is begging. If necessary, you will need the principles for such kind of prayer, for healing. That's it. This story has all the principles. He prays to Jesus. Come and heal my son, who is not just sick, but dying. He goes to Jesus in this crisis. But not everyone does that. God enables crises in our lives. And one of the goals of this crisis for us is to get closer to God. But unfortunately, not everyone does it. 
people, they often get bitter at the moment of crisis, at the moment when absolutely everything is bad. They ask God, why are you doing evil in my life? But if God had not allowed a problem in this man's life, he would never have come to Jesus. His family would never have come to Jesus. But he heard, he came, and he asked. This is a good spiritual lesson for us. Where are we now? Have you heard that Jesus can do supernatural things? Have you heard about it? Maybe in your childhood, in your youth? If never you, heard, you just have heard about this, but what will you do now? Will you go from Capernaum to Cana, to Jesus? Where are you physically located? Are you with Jesus? Can you contact him? If so, what will you ask him for today? What is the biggest problem in your life? Do you know how to find out? Very simple. When you went to bed last night or the day before yesterday or three days ago, what kept you awake? What are you worried about on the pillow? This is your crisis. You may have already tried something or maybe you have already tried a lot, connections, finances, position, and it feels like nothing is working, nothing is changing, maybe it's even getting worse. So in this crisis, there is a wonderful opportunity to come to Jesus. I do not know what is it in your life, maybe it's your son, your daughter, maybe your parents, your job, some conflict, some financial situation, something with health. Each of us has own crisis, but sooner or later there is a problem in your life. How does Jesus respond to a man's request to help his son? This is a very strange phrase. You will not believe until you see my miracles. This is a strange phrase. Because it is written that the day before Samaritans believed. How many miracles did Jesus perform in Samaria? Not a single one. It is written that at first a woman ran and began to preach. And then Jesus came and shared the word with them. It is written that they believed in his word without miracles. They believed through intellectual preaching. That was true for Samaritans, but Jesus said that Jews, Israel, cannot believe without manifestation of the power of God. And this is not bad, because all people are different. Some make a decision through intellectual, cognitive abilities, while it is very important for some to experience the supernatural actions of God in his personal life. Jesus says it's not bad. Even the Old Testament promised that when the Messiah comes, he will perform miracles and signs. That's why Jesus says it's, it's okay that you expect miracles and signs. The question is, what will you do after that? Their faith must be based on a personal experience of the supernatural power of God. John will develop this idea throughout the Gospel. Concluding in chapter 20, he will say that all these miracles and signs Jesus did so that we would have life in his name. That's it. The purpose of the miracles is to bring a person to a living relationship with God. There are now two extremes among Christians in relation to the supersensible. The first extreme is to perceive Jesus as a magical gene. I rob the magic lamp, say, in the name of Jesus Christ, and all my problems are being solved. Jesus becomes a tame magician. The second extreme is when uh, we think that God is just a wise advisor. People come to him without expecting anything supernatural and think that uh, he will give them advice and then they will do everything on their own. So, which camp are you in most often? I often find myself in this camp when I perceive God as a wise advisor. I come and think, uh, that seems somehow selfish to pray for a miracle or to ask for a miracle. 
Mm, maybe God will probably tell me do it like this or that, and I will just need to take everything in my own and do it and solve my problems. I'm, I'm not always there, but often. I don't know where you are, but in any case, Jesus says that neither one nor the other camp is the right state of the believer. We must believe that Jesus can do supernatural things, can perform miracles, but at the same time, he is not our gene. We can't manipulate him. Um, look at how the efficient reacts to the challenge of Jesus. He says, Lord, come before my son dies. How does Jesus respond to such prayer of the Father? Go, your son is well. Wonderful words. Look here. Did he answer to men's prayer? Yes, the son was healed. Another more important question is, did Jesus answer this prayer the way the man asked? No. What did the person ask for? Jesus, come with me from Can, can to Capernaum and there you will heal my son but Jesus says no, everything will be different I will heal him from here he says, come with me Jesus replies, you go home for us, this is a fundamental principle of prayer do we need to say how we would like God to solve our problems? yeah, it's necessary because it says open your desires to God God wants us to tell him our likes but on the other hand in the end we trust God that he knows better how to solve our problem he knows better how to deal with our crises if you need to come he will come if he needs to do something differently he will do something differently he is God but we are not amen to that amen tell me could Jesus go with this man to Capernaum and heal the boy physically in the presence of his presence, parents, neighbors. Yeah, of course he could. He did that in scripture before. He did not just heal, but uh, resurrected the daughter of um, other men, for example. He went straight to her room when she was dead. What's the difference? Why does Jesus decide to heal from a distance in this situation. What is the difference? What is the difference now? Who is he aimed in this situation at? He is concentrating on his father. What's the difference uh, for the father when he sees the healing or when he goes home? Yes, he does not know if it is true. He has no phone to call his wife and check if the boy is okay or not. He has to walk 40 kilometers. That was at the seventh hour, as it is written. They started time uh, in the morning and it was one o'clock p.m. Just imagine yourself in this situation. Jesus tells you, go, your son is okay. You're excited and you start walking. You walk for an hour or two and then some questions are appearing in your head. Is it true? Isn't it a joke? Did I get it right? Maybe I have to go back and to ask one more time. No, I have to go or I have to come back. Or you have to go straight forward. Listen, he is a human, as you and me. Why is it? It is for our faith, which is forms through time, through tension. There is no... In case Jesus heals the boy in a second, There is no time to form the faith. It is uncomfortable. It is very difficult when you have to wait, but it is a special circumstance that helps you to form your faith. 
Just imagine that night when he went to bed in some hotel on his way home, what was he thinking about? What is happening right now? And what, what will I see when I come home? Maybe he is already dead. No, my son is alive because Jesus told, told that. And nevertheless, he continues to trust Christ and to trust his word. And this is the second important principle. Let's talk about the word. Who told this man the word about his son being well? Jesus. How did he do it? Through the book? Through friends? In the internet? No, personally. He heard the voice from Jesus personally. I ask you, who wants to hear personal word from Jesus in your life? Are there such people? Everybody wants it. I want it every day. My dear, there is no second-hand word from Christ. You can't get the word of Jesus through any other source. There is only one source, the Holy Bible. If we raise our hands and say, I want to hear the word of God. Do you read the Bible? This is the word of God. He has told everything already. Open your Bible and read. I asked people who reads the Bible and that is that is upsetting me. The feast begins tomorrow, seven weeks of the Great Wings. Seven weeks of the Great Feast. And I don't want to put pressure on feelings of guilt. My dear, if you want to get the personal word from Jesus in your life, you can't do it without scripture, without Holy Bible, without reading it every day from the cover to the cover. I don't know what spiritual practices did you choose for this feast, but if you are in a crisis, accept the challenge to read the whole Bible fully. Can you read Bible and do not hear God? Yes, it is possible. But can you hear God without reading Bible? No, that's impossible. If you want to hear God, there is no other way. Read Bible. Study the Holy Scripture. Eat all the food God gives you. Every word is useful for you and came from God. Are there any, any verses in scripture which are useless? No, that's impossible. If you want to be healthy spiritually, eat all the God has prepared to you. If you want to hear God, read the Bible. So the man got the word personally from Jesus. If you want to move with your faith, you need to wake up, to open your Bible, to hear the voice, to hear the word from God, and then you will get the result and act due to it. So, if we are talking about the scripture, let's speak about our phones. It is very sad sometimes to come into the Church, because all people are in their phones. Some somebody is playing, somebody is chatting. Again, I don't want to put pressure on you, but I have a question: Why did you come? Why have you come? Look at your children; they're all in their phones. So why are they here? 
In 10 years, these children are not in the church. And parents say, I was taking him to the church since childhood, but why did you do that? Did you show him the example of how to worship, how to pray, how to read the Bible, how to study, how to communicate? No, you just gave, gave him the phone and that was everything. So what could he learn from this? Just imagine our God from heaven is here among us. We gathered for him and you are just at your phone. Can God look at you and think, oh, this man is ready to get the word from me. No, that does not work like this. Don't give so much disrespect to God. That's not the place. I mean, you can come here for that, but what will you get? You have already spent some time here to come, to be here, but what will you get? Nothing. This man, he wanted to get something. He wasn't wasting his time, but he came to Jesus and asked him. He was praying to him. He was begging, please go with me and heal my son. And he got this. If you want to get something, some answer, some miracle from Jesus, you want to be in this state of your mind. Parents, be ready to get the fruits from your children which you put in them. This is your responsibility right now. So, knowing that Jesus can make miracles, pray right now, get his word, believe in it. Amen. Jesus can perform miracles personally in your life, and that's great. But more than that, he not only solve one problem, he can change all the life, and this is much better. This is our third point from the verse 31. The official goes home, sleeps, and in the morning he meets his servants who tells them, your son is okay. Wonderful words for any parent. I would be great to hear such words about my wife, family, friends, about each of you. To hear the words that he's okay, he's healthy, and he will leave. But this man asked his servants, by the way, pay attention, he has servants. At what hour did he get better? Why? Why this question? He wants to check because he still has questions. Is it true? Maybe that's coincidence. But when, when he get evidences, look at the result. Believed he and whole his household. So firstly, he believed his word, the word of the Jesus, and now he believed in Jesus. What is the difference? Firstly, he believed that Jesus can heal his son. He believed in miracle first that the problem can be solved. But in verse 33, he believed in Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. This is the difference. We see how the faith or from the miracle turns into the true faith. How, how his life changed. All his household believed. They all gave their lives to Jesus. Yes, it is great to get the healing, but even better that this boy did not just die, but he received 
the true eternal life with Jesus. It is important because I see a lot of people who get miracles, supernatural things from God, and they stop there. They do not believe in God, in Jesus. Because even if you got one, two, three, ten miracles, but you didn't believe in Jesus, you will end up in hell. This is the question of the life and death. Why do you need these miracles if you are going to hell? Unfortunately, there are lots of people who experience supernatural power of Jesus but don't follow him because they need only miracles and don't need God at all. I hope that it's not true for you. You have experienced the miracles in your life. You have raised your hands already. So what has changed in your life? Has the life changed and been dedicated to Jesus already? If not, this is the moment. So all your family can look at you and tell that we want it too. We want our life to be changed. The story about the boy who was about to die, but did not. Where in scripture do we read another story about many families where boys had to die but God said that if people obey and do something, what He says them to do, they will stay alive. Yes, this is the story of Exodus. And they needed the blood of the Lamb. And the head of the family, the father, had to believe in this, take the blood and put it on their doors so all the family could have the miracle. Two chapters ago, the John the Baptist says about Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So to say, Jesus says, I'm starting the new Exodus. He repeats the story of the first Exodus. This man believed in the sacrifice of the Holy Lamb and his boy will live forever with God. It's an amazing story, not about the miracle only, but about being born again. John was writing that all these signs and all these miracles are only for you to believe in Jesus and have an eternal life in his name. Our today's paragraph ends up with verse 54. So, uh, two signs in Cana of Galilee. He connects two signs. The first, water into wine, and the second, this one. So, on the one hand, these miracles are very different, but on the other hand, they are somehow connected. The first sign, it is wedding, a lot of joy. This atmosphere is absolutely not joy and gay. It is upsetting. But Jesus says, I can help you both in the moment of the holiday and in the moment of the crisis. I'm here, I'm with you, I'm ready to be with you and help you. What is similar about the situations? Here the woman asks and here the man asks for something, for somebody. We have the prayer and we have the obedience, how people obey Jesus' word. They pour water into the jars. Here, man goes home. And the result, everything ends up that all the disciples believed in Jesus. And our today's story ends up that all the officials in his household believed 
in Jesus. So the author shows us the connection between miracles and true faith and life changing. This is our aim too. Now, at the end, let's come back to the question which we asked at the beginning. Why did Jesus go to the Galilee? How many people believed after the miracle with the official? Not many. Him and his family only. What will Jesus do after that? In next verses we read that he will come back. So we see that Jesus went from Jerusalem to Galilee and came back and did only one thing. He healed this boy. For me that's incredible. You see that no matter how busy is Jesus at the moment, that's no matter how many tasks is he doing right now but we matter to him and he can come for only one boy dying for only one family if you feel far away from God if you think that he does not pay any attention that's not true you matter to God Amen let's pray Look deep into your heart. What prayer will you come with? Jesus, thank you that you let us together here together, not two or three, but hundreds of people in your name today here, because we believe that you can do miracles. Your supernatural, powerful God. You hasn't changed since the time. You continue to change the world. Come into our life and do that no one can explain. And we're happy that we can come to such an incredible God and Savior. We see this man praying to you, Come, Jesus, and we pray the same. Come, Jesus. Right now, Jesus, you hear so many prayers of the hearts from this place. You hear so many problems. Some problems are connected with family, sons, daughters, parents, grandparents, finances, health, conflicts. I don't know, but you know, Jesus. Listen to these prayers. We are praying to you, please bless us with your Holy Spirit. Tomorrow, the great feast is fasting. Please bless us for this sp spiritual act so we can get ready, can get prepared to the Easter so we can get closer to you. Trust you all our problems. Probably someone needs to be forgiven. And today we pray, please give power to forgive somebody or give us enough humbleness to ask for forgiveness, to say sorry. Let our families to see the light in us our families, friends, neighbors, maybe we need to invite somebody to Norris next time. Please bless us. Every crisis, any problem which you hear now in prayers, we accept that we try to solve it ourselves using our connections, finances, some manipulations, but we don't want to do it anymore and we can't. Jesus, come and heal, come and help. Then more than that, we pray to you not only about some certain problem to be solved, but we also want to believe in you, 
Believe not only that you can do miracles, but believe in you as our Savior. We pray to you so our life can change and people around us can see your grace, see your light, see your power. Please bless us, Lord. Let us believe in you. Let us live in your name. Amen.